Okay, so data is literally everywhere, right? And it's always telling us stories. But here's the thing. How do we know if those stories are actually true? That's the big challenge. And statistics? Well, that's the tool we use to figure it out. Think of it like a language that helps us listen to what the data is really saying and separate the truth from, you know, just noise. So let's dive in. This right here, this is the question at the heart of pretty much all statistics. You see a pattern, right? Maybe a difference between two groups or a trend that seems to be going up. But how can you be sure it's a real thing and not just, I don't know, random luck, a fluke? And trust me, it's way harder to tell just by looking than you'd think. So the key here isn't about finding some kind of absolute 100% proof. Instead, statistics is more like our guide. It's this amazing tool that actually calculates the probability, the likelihood that what we're looking at is just random chance. And that is how we find a real meaningful signal in all the background noise of the world. All right, so where do we even start this whole journey? Well, it's not with some crazy, complicated math. Nope. Before we ask any big questions, we have to just get to know our data. Kind of like a first impression. We need to understand its basic personality, you could say. This first step is the foundation for everything, and I mean everything, that comes next. Okay, this is pretty much the golden rule of data. Before you do anything fancy, you have to look at your data. I mean, really look at it. Make a graph. Scan the numbers. Are there any obvious patterns jumping out at you? Anything that looks weird, like a number that's way off from everything else? This first gut check is so important because it's going to guide every single decision you make from this point on. So when you're looking at your data, you'll find it usually comes in two main flavors. First, you've got continuous data. Think of things you can measure, like height or temperature. It can be any value in a range, right? 6 foot 1, 6 foot 1.1, and so on. Then you've got categorical data. This is stuff that fits into neat little boxes, like eye color, blue, brown, green, or maybe the brand of a car. You're either one or the other. Knowing which type you have is like step one. It's super critical for everything else. And the type of data you have tells you exactly how you should graph it. For that continuous stuff, a histogram is your best friend. It basically sorts the numbers into bins so you can see the overall shape of your data, like where is it all clumped together. And for the categorical data, a simple bar chart is perfect. It just lets you easily compare how many things are in each category. Honestly, using the right chart is half the battle in telling an accurate story. Okay, so once we've seen our data, we usually want to summarize it. And the first thing we look for is the center. The most famous way to do this is the mean. You know this one. It's the classic average you learned about back in grade school. It's a really solid way to get a single number to represent your data, but it's got one huge weakness. And that weakness is exactly why the median is so incredibly useful. The median is just the dead center middle value when you line up all your numbers from smallest to largest. The cool thing is, it couldn't care less about crazy high or low numbers, which gives it a massive advantage sometimes. And this slide shows you exactly what I'm talking about. So imagine that one dot way off to the right is a huge outlier. Think about it like you're looking at salaries in a company and that dot is the CEO's massive salary. See how it drags the mean way over, away from where most of the data is? That one number is totally skewing the average, making it look higher than it really is for most people. But look at the median. It stays planted right in the middle of the pack. It gives you a much more honest picture of where the true center is. Pro tip. If you see a big gap between your mean and your median, that's a huge red flag that you've got some outliers messing with your data. Okay, so we've looked at our data. We've gotten to know it a bit. Now it's time for the next big step, asking a real specific question we can actually test. We're shifting gears here from just looking at things to actively questioning the numbers. You know, you can think of every statistical test as a showdown between two competing stories. First, you've got the null hypothesis. This is the boring default story. It's the idea that nothing special is happening, that there's no real difference or effect. And then you have the alternative hypothesis. This is your idea. This is the new, exciting story you're trying to tell, that there is a specific effect, a real difference. The whole point of the test is to see if you've got enough evidence to throw out that default story and say, hey, my new idea is probably right. All right, we've got our two competing stories ready. Now it's time for the main event, the test itself. This is really the moment of truth. This is where we run the numbers to decide if what we're seeing is the real deal or if it could have just been a random fluke. And what comes out of this test is one single but incredibly powerful number, the p-value. I like to call it the flucometer. Basically, it tells you the chances of seeing the data you saw 
if that boring default null hypothesis were true. So a really small p-value means it's super unlikely that you'd see this pattern by pure random chance. And here it is, the magic number, at least by convention. If your p-value is 0.05 or less, we generally call the result statistically significant. What does that mean? It means there's only a 5% chance or less that we're seeing this pattern just because of random luck. And if we hit that threshold, we get to reject the boring default story and say, yeah, our effect is probably real. Now, of course, it's not like there's just one single test for everything. The tool you pick totally depends on the question you're asking. For example, if you're just comparing the averages of two groups, something called a t-test is your classic go-to tool. But if you've got more than two groups, you need something different, maybe a tool called ANOVA. Look, you don't have to memorize all the formulas. The big takeaway is that you have to match the right tool to the right job. Okay, so up until now, we've been talking about finding differences between groups. But what if we want to look for relationships? You know, what if we want to see if two different things seem to move together? Like when one thing goes up, does the other one go up too? Or does it go down? Well, that is exactly where correlation comes in. It's a measurement that gives you a single number, usually called R, and it goes from negative one to positive one. If it's positive, it means that as one thing goes up, the other tends to go up too. If it's negative, it's the opposite. As one goes up, the other tends to go down. And the closer that number is to either positive or negative one, the stronger the relationship is. All right, listen up. If you remember only one single thing from our entire chat today, please make it this. A strong correlation shows a relationship, yes, but it does not, I repeat, does not prove that one thing causes the other. This is easily the biggest mistake people make with statistics, and it's so, so important to get it right. So you're probably asking, why? Why isn't correlation the same as causation? Well, it's because there are always other possible explanations. I mean, sure, maybe X causes Y, that's one option, but couldn't Y be causing X? The relationship could go the other way. And what's often the case is that there's some hidden third thing, a confounding variable, that's actually causing both of them to move together. And hey, let's be honest, sometimes it's just pure dumb luck, a total coincidence. Wow, okay. We've actually covered a ton of ground here, so let's take a second and recap this whole journey from that very first glance at the data all the way to our final conclusion. It really boils down to these four steps. Step one, observe. You look at your data, you graph it, you get a feel for it. Step two, question. You come up with a really specific testable question, your null and alternative hypotheses. Step three, test. You pick the right tool for the job and you calculate that all important p-value. And finally, step four, interpret. You decide if your result is significant and you figure out what it actually means. Always, always remembering things like correlation does not equal causation. You see, in the end, statistics isn't really just about math and formulas. It's a structured way of thinking. It gives us a process, a method for looking at evidence and making smart decisions in a world that's, well, it's messy, it's complicated, and it's absolutely filled with randomness. And that kind of brings us to one last big idea to think about. Data can tell a story. And these tools we've talked about, they're incredibly powerful for finding those stories and for telling them. But with that power comes a really big responsibility, right? What is our responsibility to tell that story truthfully, to be careful and to be honest? Something to think about. Thanks for joining me.